Sadashi was four days shy of his 20th birthday, majoring in physics at UCLA, when he was uprooted and interned at Manzanar, California, along with countless other Japanese Americans. While imprisoned at Manzanar, he continued his studies and taught high school physics to students at Manzanar High School. After about a year and a half, he was granted freedom in order to teach Japanese to U.S. Army reservists during World War II. He served in the U.S. Army in occupied Japan as a soldier and interpreter under the leadership of General MacArthur. He worked many years at the Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore Labs. He is a longtime resident of Livermore. He is a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. I'm sorry, the Congressional Gold Medal. Now, please join me in welcoming Tadashi Kishi. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me to speak today. As I said, I'll probably mess up. <laughs> today we live in a very dangerous world. In 2011, our president, Barack Hussein Obama, signed into law under the National Defense Act, Section 1012, that can incarcerate anyone without due process. And even if you're a veteran, that doesn't hold. You are culpable to be put in a prison without any recourse of your rights as citizen. This is my story about my incarceration at Manzanar. When I was 11 years old, I heard over the school's loudspeaker system, I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear to faithfully execute the office of the United States and to the best of my ability will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. How hollow those words sound as I see our Constitution literally lying in the dust at Manzanar. For many years, my two sons wanted to hear about my past, especially Manzanar. Try as I may, tears would flow, and my voice would crack as I tried to use a voice recorder to record my story. I had become a silent American. The name was coined by a fellow Japanese American for young Niseis who were sent to America's godforsaken desert land. I was 20 years old, and my draft status was 1A citizen. Without my knowledge, the government changed me to foresee enemy alien because I looked like the enemy. I could not talk about the internment because of the betrayal and injustice by my government. Then one day, when my wife and I were visiting our son Gregory and Melanie down in Tucson, my granddaughter asked me to write about Manzanar for her school assignment. Isabel was our first grandchild, and I couldn't disappoint her. Yet I did not talk about that terrible period, but rather what I gained by going through that period of 
injustice. People who would reach out and befriend me and never work, wait for a thank you. Then, of course, the wonderful family that you and I started. And I realized I had to write about Manzanar. I called it Things Unsaid to Give to Isabel. But it was a tone, factual, yes, but stiff like a technical manual. And if you're a programmer, you know what I mean by a technical manual. You hate to open the page. But anyway, it was stiff. And I wondered, could, would anybody ever bother to turn to the next page? Then I saw an announcement of a writing class. It was taught by Linda Tacey, writing from life experience. I was hesitant to take the class because my background is math and science. But I took a step forward. It was a class to begin writing without worrying about grammar, punctuation, and organization. And the best thing, there are no grades. And I found myself writing a poem for a class exercise. I had never done anything with poems. It was usually roses are red, violets are blue. This is the best I can do. But anyway, I began to write a poem for a class exercise. Teacher would say, take, take a word or phrase or anything and go with it. And so one day I read the lines at the news on the radio by a poem, Telephone Repairman, by Joe Miller. And suddenly the December 7, 1941, flashed through my mind. As a, right, as a result, I wrote the poem, Pen. All right. The poem pen. What happened to you after the news, the day of infamy on the radio? You open your mouth and you're just a gurgle. Your mind is racing to spew its data. And from one corner of Cramine Street, screams out a voice, I want to be heard. Another, another reach out. Oh, listen, I want you to know, there's chaos in your mind, for time and space have no meaning. Yet from your lips and a word or sentence may flow. But the acid in your stomach eats away. A tear may drop, for a voice screams, remember how deep that hurt remains. There are words, but your voice is cracking. You realize you're not making sense. Silence is now your safe place. Yes, I have been there. I could not talk about Manzanar. I was in that safe place. Another time a granddaughter's voice is heard, Please tell how you felt about that time. You, <coughs> you pick up a voice recorder, but that won't do. You pick up a pen and begin to write. The words suppressed so long all cry out wanting to be heard. But your hand is now in control. You will pick and choose your moment in time. No acid can engulf the words you write. Your heart beats strong and sometimes wildly. You are in control and you write. A story that long remains so deep. The pen is mightier than the sword, they say, but it's more than that. It is a brush that can paint the story, give life and feelings and hope that remain so deep. It's more than a sword and paintbrush, too. It is a light that reveals what hid me. It is the antidote that heals the wound. I had written that poem in the first year, and the park district wanted some samples of our writing, so I submitted two, and they chose ten. And when I was standing at the show and tell, a young lady approached me and said, may I have a copy of your poem? Of course I was flattered because someone wanted to read my poem. Then she said, when I was a young girl, my father and I were very close. Then he went off to war, and he's been silent ever since. She held that paper and went off, and in my heart, I just hoped her father would pick up a pen and maybe that young lady would find her father again. I had started a journey and the pen would be the light would shine in those dark corners. And I had to be honest with my story, otherwise it would be fiction. When I was a youngster, I never knew 
that I was any different from anybody else until someone called me a Jap. My father just moved his nursery from Sawtail to Santa Monica on the southeast corner of Wilshire and 25th Street. This was my first day to start first grade, first grade at Santa Monica McKinley School. Just as I stepped on the schoolyard, someone began yelling, jab, jab, jab. One, one kid in particular came after me. Instinctively, I turned and rushed in to stop him from taunting me. The fight was on. The kids would always come and say, fight, fight, fight. I had the better of him. But the school principal came on and stopped us in fight and marched us into his office. When the school principal asked the kid, do you know what Jack meant? He didn't have a clue. That's not the first time, nor the last time that I was bullied, and I fought back each time. I am an Issei, second generation Japanese American, and I lived in two worlds. One, at home I'm Japanese. One step outside, I'm an American. And I found that sometimes those two worlds were at odds with each other. When I'm in the American world, I'm free to express my feelings. I can even put my hands out and shake someone. I can even put my arms around someone that I know and, and say, gee, I'm so happy to see it. But in my other world, that is a no-no. When I saw the president take out his hand and shake the emperor's hand, that was a faux pas. When I saw the Mrs. Obama put her arms around the queen, that again was a no-no. You do not do that in the Japanese culture. When I was growing up, my mother never scolded us and raised her voice or anything. And when I was growing up, I always felt that I was in a no-drama where someone is playing this music on the side and chanting, and the actors, you do not see your face. You see a mask that covers them, and they are acting out the thing. That's the life I went through as a child at home. No feelings. Mother never cried, never scolded us. And even when she went to Manzanar, she did not cry, she did not yell or scream. She, in her gentle way, looked after us when she was really in dire straits. When I was going to school, uh, I saw a number of principals just because someone had called me a Jap or something and they wanted to get at me. I guess I had this chip on my shoulder and that would, anybody would knock it off, I would be right there. But anyway, I managed to stay out of serious trouble. As an American, our conduct is determined by guilt. We are innocent until proven guilty. In contrast, shame, or haji in Japanese, is the essence of Japanese culture. I remember when, I can't remember the incident, but my father, at the end of scolding us, would say, Hajiwashire, which means, do not bring shame upon the family name. During, going forward, there were young Niseis who volunteered to serve in the U.S. Army, and the advice they got from their father was, do not bother to come home if you disgrace our family name. At high school, I studied hard because our parents would say, study hard because people can take everything from you. But schoolwork is never an issue for me. And I studied hard. And I found that my high school teacher would acknowledge my achievement in class. One day, my physics teacher, Mr. McHenry, asked me to conduct his physics class. At first, I was nervous, and, but I composed myself and conducted class. Later, Mr. McHenry said I did well. 
But he suggested I go and do research instead of teaching. I was hesitant to ask him why. But it was, wasn't, excuse me. But it was in my high school class that I, that I, <clears throat> that is in my civics class. I learned how our forefathers, patriots, sacrificed all to give us freedom, liberty, and justice. And I was, guess this, I was awed by the responsibility of Congress to protect those rights under the Constitution. I even thought the words of the Constitution were meant for me, a citizen. I was naive indeed. <laughs> then one day, I read the following lines about the Statue of Liberty, and I was proud of our nation. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. The wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Save these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I thought those words of hope and better life in America was meant for my parents who had immigrated from Japan. Again, I was wrong. I did not know that our government had passed laws forbidding Japanese to become citizens and to own property and they were vilified. They could not become a part of the American stream. I found the truth, and I was in the camp that those draconian laws were on top my, my parents. My father had uh, immigrated from Japan because Japan was a chaotic period of hardship. It was after the, the shoguns were uh, lost their powers and the emperor was uh, restored to his throne. And the emperor had a revolutionary task to change Japan from an agrarian economy to an industrial one. And the task required huge expenditure, further exasperating the finance of the Japanese. I could not question. One day I heard my father talking to his, my older brother Joe about why he came to America. I heard him say the word Junsa, which is policeman. It was one of the prospects he had back in Japan. But it was enough, not enough to help the family through the hard times. Then when a U.S. company came to recruit people to work on a railroad, he took the job. He said the job was hard, but he endured the hardship. Then he had an opportunity to farm in California. I could not question my parents about their past because I could not read and write Japanese. And I, when I look at the magazine and the newspaper, all I saw was chicken scratchers on the pages. I was curious. I was intrigued. And I was hungry to learn Japanese. Then a miracle happened. My father, among other East Sages, donated funds to start a Japanese school when I was going to the, the junior high. Every day after the junior high class, I rushed to the Japanese school, eager to learn. And even at night, I studied my Japanese diligently. And I even got up early in the morning before anybody else got up and went outside and took my book and read it, read it aloud to review my lesson. By the time I had entered high school, I had mastered reading and writing Japanese. At least that's what I thought. Let me point out something. During World War II, the Japanese language is very difficult because the Japanese never had a written language until the monks came from China and brought the Cantonese language. And the shogun realized that we needed a Japanese language. And so they married the Japanese phonics with the Chinese character. So in order to learn Japanese, you had to know the Chinese character, you had to know the Japanese. And they 
really butchered some things up that's very difficult. And even the commanders in the Pacific Theater were arrogant enough to believe that there would be no foreigners that could understand Japanese. And they were arrogant enough to put their commands in Japanese, not coded. They paid the and, and they paid the price. Well, I studied, as I said, I studied Japanese real diligently. And I, when I was in high school, they had a show and tell uh, one night. And I was awarded as the outstanding Japanese student. Now, you would think there would be people get up and say, bravo, ha, ah, hooray, run. I looked at my mother. There was no acknowledgement that I had been the outstanding student. Japanese do not show their, their emotions. They do not come shout and scream and so forth. And so here I was, I'm supposed to be the outstanding student, and nobody's looking at me. Later on, my mother gave me a present. And she gave me a present. It was a statuette of Nimo Miyakinjiro. And I wondered, what in the hell is this statuette? You know, I'm a teenager. I would rather have a pencil or, or a watch. But a statuette, well, all I could do was to put, make it a paperweight. So I, I had mastered Japanese. And it would later on become a, a part of my life. <laughs> of course, it held really a part of my life, which is Manzanar. It was December 7, 1941, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, when our world collapsed. Come quickly. And listen to the radio, said my sister-in-law frantically, as she rushed to where I was working in the family nursing. Oh my God, did you hear on the radio? Japan attacked Pearl Harbor this morning. Our jaws dropped and our eyes wide open. And disbelief it would have what had happened. All we could mutter was, why, why, why did this happen? Then a disquieting silence filled the room. Suddenly, the FBI in the black sedan screeched the hall in front of the nursery. Two agents jumped out of the car, ran into the nursery looking for my father, found him, seized him, handcuffed him, and sped off in the black sedan. Our nightmare was just beginning on that day of infamy. I went home to be with mother in Okasa, I'm sorry. There I saw two agents rummaging the whole house, looking for something or anything, left everything strewn on the floor. And I saw my Okasa and ashen face as they both stood by, unable to intervene, as the agent acted like this stopper. Then suddenly, they turned on my father with smirks on their faces and began to question Otosa mercy about the conversation he had or didn't have, days, weeks, and even months before December 7th, by using information they had gained by secretly wiretapping our phone line, unknowing we were facing a tsunami that would sweep over the lives of all Japanese. The first wave swept all the prominent leaders of the Japanese community and tossed them to federal prison. Our nation was filled with hatred. Lies after lies taunted us from the media, the hate mongers, the opportunists, and even the clergy spewed their vitriol at us. Then, on February 19, 1942, Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued Executive 9044, 9066, and our fate was sealed in doom. Then, wave after wave, swept the rest of us from our home and left us an unforgiving desert land. This was the price we paid for looking like the enemy in the land of the free. Surprised that we bore with Japan? 
Wisconsin, not only did the FBI wiretap the phone lines of the Japanese days, weeks, and months before December 7th, but the U.S. Army was anticipating an armed conflict with Japan. They had selected all the Japanese Americans who were drafted under the first U.S. Selective Service Act of 1940 and sent them to a newly established Army Intelligence School to learn Japan's military language. They were sent to Chrissy Field, San Francisco, in November of 1941. The mission of the MIS was to intercept, decode, and translate Japan's military communication. The graduate of the MIS served in the front lines in Aleutian, in the Philippines, and all of the South Pacific, and even Burma and Indochina. They were all, every, every interpreter was accompanied by U.S. personnel so that, that they would not be mistaken as an enemy soldier. Let me add at this point, those young men who served in the military service, according to General MacArthur, they had shortened the war by at least two years and had probably saved millions of American lives. The U.S. Army invited the U.S. Navy to participate, but the Navy declined. Instead, they started their own military intelligence school at Boulder, Colorado, and didn't want to deal with any Japanese American. It was now, excuse me, it was now, April 21, time to say goodbye to our homes. We were more fortunate than some who had only 24 hours or 48 hours to round up their lives and leave what was at home. Sadly, we stored things without any certainty that we would ever retrieve them again. Burned were items that define who we were, Japanese. The rest we just abandoned, except for the meager 80 pounds that our generous government allowed to carry on our journey. No cameras, no radios allowed, leaving us isolated and ignorant about the world around us. <laughs> and I remember that, that, that day that we had to live, uh, leave our homes. And that bus ride haunts me to this very day. We had arrived at Manzana, California. I saw Bob wires encircling a large campground. And there were four watchtowers for surveillance. On top of the watchtower <coughs> was a searchlight and a guard standing next to a, to a machine gun. They told us these camps would pr protect us from harm. But why were those menacing machine gun and searchlight pointing inward at us? As we entered the campground, I saw the hastily built barracks covered with tar paper and held together with wooden slats. And for fire protection, there was this very big open fire break separating the columns of the barracks. This is my home in the land of the free, not a very pleasant sight. The time to t travel, registering, and processing and quarter Simon had taken so long. We were too late for supper that night. Breakfast would be our first meal in time, tent and camp. As I watched the internees entering the mess hall, they moved with expressionless face, 
like zombies marching across the serving line. And somewhere in this room, I, I could hear a child crying or fussing. The only, the only other noise, noise I heard was this slop, slop, slop. If you've ever been in the service, you know what I mean, going across the serving line. There's a slop, slop, slop. There's food being spooned on the plate. The best I can remember of the first breakfast in, in camp was this lumpy mound of oatmeal and burnt toast with butter ration. Apple butter was choice of management. Sugar? I had no sugar on the table. All the sugar ration went to the Caucasian dining room. The dinner meal was very interesting. The dinner meal was a challenge for the bravest and daring. The tasty entree, get this, was a reconstituted, mummified beef liver. I definitely heard the clunk as that tissue mat hit my plate. One bite was enough for me. Later, I heard that some of the food consignment sent to Manzanar had stencil on it, not for human consumption. I believe it. At first, the family gathered just like back home together to go for meals. But this soon became a meaningless exercise. Camp life was no longer what it was be back at home. Back home, mealtime gave a sense of togetherness and family structure. And family structure. That had now become a community affair. The home that gave us privacy and security was now an open boat. There was a sense of pride, of dignity, and a life of confinement. Every day was monotonous and boring. And motion just to fill the time of day. It was truly a sense of hopelessness. And the Japanese would say, shikata ga nai, can't be helped, tough it out. With one stroke of the pen, my family's, my parents' culture was left in shambles. He saved fathers who were breadwinners and authority figures were no longer relevant camp. They were not allowed to impart their wisdom, wisdom in the camp of her. Every day, I saw them sitting on the doorstep, dejected, rejected, and disbelieving what had happened to their lives and fortunes in America. And I often wonder, what are they thinking? Will they rise above their silence? English only was strictly enforced for camp discussion. Teaching Japanese was strictly forbidden for fear of infusing nationalism in the children. What balderdash! How would I, a Japanese, young Japanese American, be able to speak intelligently with my parents if I didn't know Japanese or even learn about my heritage? And the Japanese school that I went to was considered the hotbed of subversive teaching. Again, balderdash. What nonsense. I'm glad I had a chance to learn Japanese while I was going to public school. Mother's rule was shattered too. We are now wards of the federal government. And our role to nurture and dote on the children and protect them had also become a meaningless exercise. Back home, at mealtime, we were together at one. Mother was the last person to sit down with us. There was a set protocol. The firstborn son was always served first. Then according to Japanese custom, the firstborn, the firstborn son, I'm sorry, the father served first, and the firstborn son was served next, and the rest is according to our ages. Mother was the last person to sit down with us. The kitchen was a domain, and I hardly ever saw my father enter that sacred place. Mother's kitchen was replaced by a mess hall. Her children scattered at daybreak, and they went to be with their friends, and even ate at different mess hall. I too was guilty of that dis indiscretion. And why not? When someone said, hey, the camp, cook and camp too is serving beef tonight, 
Instead of that usual slop in our mess hall, you are off and running. Life had just become a game to survive in this hell home. After days in, in my beautiful home, the 16 by 20 foot room, the walls had these bare studs hanging. There was this low and incandescent line hanging, hardly ever giving any light or brightening anybody's life. And there was a pot belly stove for heat. And then there was the, Amer the U.S. Army cots. But there was no partition. And so the evacuees had to hang sheets or blankets to try to define their own space. I was going stir crazy if I stood in that stayed in that room more than one minute, and I all through my time in the in the in the Manzanar camp, I never sat in that room more than one minute. I would only go there to sleep, and that was it. So I was going stir crazy, and I need to find something to do. So I went down to the administration building to read the bulletin board. I found the early attorney had taken the cushy office job. What was left was a job for a swamper. Now someone asked me what a swamper is. I hope you know. That's a gorilla who can unload 19, 99 pounds of cement from a trailer. <laughs> Believe you me. So I went down to the warehouse to apply, and the supervisor said that they needed someone strong enough to help unload merchandise trucked in the camp. He took my application and said I could start working. The job was sweaty, dusty, and invariably you end up with cuts and scratches on your arm, like you've been in a fight with a well cut. But at least after an exhausting day, I felt that another day had passed in this hell hole. But I kept hoping it would be something better than sit on my butt waiting to move merchandise. Then my prayer was answered. There was an announcement for training teachers evacuees for teacher assignment under the Manzanar School Program. On the day of the announcement, there were over 200 people wanting to know about this program. When they learned the requirement for teacher certificate, the number quickly dropped to 60 college-trained individuals. The person who wanted to become a teacher and get a credential had to take university-level courses in education, psychology, and so forth. The course was taught under the auspices of the University of California through their extension division. Because it required a commitment to take those courses and pass, the number quickly dropped to 23. The final count was 14. I was determined to meet the challenge. One crispy night, on my way to one of those classes, I stopped for a moment in that open fire break. And I asked myself, is this all you want to do with your life? And I, as I stood there in the darkness, I could make out the dim outlines of the barracks and the long incandescent line hanging from the sea, never brightened anybody's life. And I envisioned people in those one-room homes trying to make the best out of their terrible predicament. It was an uneasy, uncomfortable thought. Then at that moment, I said to myself, I'm not about to die in this reservation. Then as I look, I suddenly realized Manzanar personified hate. Hate was what brought me here, and I vowed that hate would never be a part of my vocabulary. I have kept my promise. But for now, I had a commitment to teach something good, something to look for. And I really worked hard to take all those courses and paths. After th three months and weeks and so forth, I finally finished those courses and I was accepted to teach high school physics. The school was down at the block one along the administration building. And my office was in the 
laundry room modified for office and science school, science school supplies. On the first day, I met two Niseis, Moss Nakagawa and Hideo Ueda, who were assigned to teach chemistry. We chatted for a while. Said, Let's go see what we have. Believe you me, there was nothing. We had to implement the basic science equipment for our classes. My classroom was on the end, at the end of the barracks, and I didn't believe it would be any different from my own barracks at home in, in, in camp. When I opened the door, I felt no warmth in this room. The floor was this ugly linoleum. The walls was unpainted plasterboard. There was a table in front that would serve as my desk. And across the front wall was a blackboard. But it was homemade. It was painted black. Every day through that semester, that blackboard was a challenge, a friend as well as a foe. My writing would show up on the blackboard. Then the paint would start to peel off and the, keep the student guessing, what does that teacher write? This is my first day, and I didn't see any happy faces. Only puzzled look, wondering, who can this teacher be? Who can't be much older than I? But they showed me respect. It is part of the Japanese culture to respect authority, especially a sensei. I was never nervous about teaching because I was focused on teaching physics, a subject that I was confident about, and they would never, never hear one word about the justice of Manstar, only physics. As I stood there in front of the class, I could see who was eager to learn and those that were just occupying space. I'm sure you know if you've gone to school, the latter would sit in the back, not wanting to be seen or wanting to be heard or participate in camp discussion and this course discussion. Camp life is not a place when you can motivate students to learn. Even the cultural pressure to study hard was non-existent. And throughout the semester, I wondered if I'm too hard on the children and if the subject matter is getting through. I am no longer in doubt. It was some 40 or 50 years later when the mansion had closed. I got a, received a phone call from one of my former students. I got this phone call from a former student in my physics class. He, Gordon Sato, said that after he left Mandanar, he had volunteered and served in, in Korea. A little bit more? Okay. Lollipop. <laughs> okay. He said that after he graduated, uh, I'm sorry, he served in the U.S. Army in Korea, and then he used the GI Bill to get his bachelor degree in biochemistry from USC in 1951. Then he went on to Caltech to get his doctorate degree in biophysics in 1955. He didn't tell me any more than that, but he said that he was on a project to Eritrea, Africa. Using his scientific knowledge and his experience at Manzanar, he called it the Manzanar Project. His goal was to make Eritrea, the poorest nation in Africa, to become self-sufficient. He said he just wanted to come to see me, to thank me for inspiring him to get a college education. I was humbled by those two words. Just two words, thank you, made up for all the work I did to teach physics. 